I don't know a single operator that was ever sad they were in a gunfight. I don't know a single operator that's got PTSD from killing the enemy. It just doesn't happen. I think that's important for people to recognize. And it may come across as psychotic, but you need to keep in mind that we spend our entire lives training for this moment. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. We weren't out there to take country, we were out on your That was their job. I did feel a lot of regret. Friends were still getting killed. It got to the point where, you know, you're going to humans quite often. Do I lead under fire? And that was a heavy responsibility, I guess, on my shoulders that I didn't want to screw up. War itself is horrific. It's a horror story. It should never be dressed up as if it's something glorious. Not what you can do for yourself, but what can you do for your country? The volunteer for service was in effect to put your life on the line. I'm Alex Lloyd, and you're listening to Life on the Line. Scott Ryder served for 22 years with the Australian Army, including 16 years as an operator with the 2nd Commando Regiment. He served in East Timor and multiple tours of Afghanistan and Iraq. He holds numerous commendations and a Masters of Business, and he works in veteran charities. He is the author of a newly published book, Forged in Fire. Scott Ryder, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me, mate. So, Scott, you're coming on to promote your new book, Forged in Fire, which is the first book that's sort of published by 2nd Commando Regiment veteran that's looking at that whole big picture. Other SF veterans have published their books before, perhaps with a different focus, coming from a different background. This is touting itself as the commando insight and story. Not that you are the commando, but more that you are giving that window, that insight into the regiment. Before we go back to the beginning and talk about your story, what was the drive to write this book? Yeah, thanks, mate. Look, I think this is the first sort of a commando book, but that certainly doesn't mean that I'm the best person for it or it's a complete historical account of the regiment and everything it's done. That would be a very myopic view to take if people thought that was the intent. The book essentially, mate, is it's my story of my time in the regiment, being there in 2007 to retiring last year. And more importantly, the the genesis story and the growth of the organization. And I think that's something that hasn't been well documented. You know, there certainly isn't a lot of commentary about it. I think it's important for SF units to remain an, ele- an element of anonymity. I don't think that everything should be public. And this book certainly does not expose anything that shouldn't be exposed. It's been vetted by defense. I think it's really important, mate, for the second commando regiment, you know, starting from four hour commando has had over 30% of all fatalities in Afghanistan are from one unit, which is two commando, yet there is not much out there. So initially it started as a way of sort of me collecting my thoughts and stories as I transitioned from defence last year. Then it sort of morphed into this project, which ultimately became the book. I think it's important. It's it's not an entire account of two commando. It's my time in the regiment through my eyes. That's an important element to point out. So that's the mission statement. Let's go back and look at your story. Where did it start? Where did you grow up? I was actually born in Kathmandu, Nepal. Dad's uh, Nepalese, mum's Aussie, born there in the early 80s and lived there till I was about 12. Then we moved to Australia around uh, 1994. Do you recall the sort of first gravitation you had towards things military and interest in that? Do you have family military history? Uh, look, it's it's funny. Um, my family on my mum's side and dad's side both served in the military, but it skipped a few generations. So in that sense, I was a black sheep. My immediate family, there was no interest in the military and, and I'm not entirely sure where it fostered from, but from a really young age, I had a really strong interest in the military. Um, then we moved to Australia, I think that, that just grew to the point where I was 12 and I knew that my you know, my destiny, my destiny rather, was to, was to join the army. So I had a very clear path from a very young age, but I'm uncertain exactly where that came from. Did you have an interest in the history of Australian military history? Were you athletic? Like I'm sort of trying to get a picture of what your interests were as a boy as well. I did, did a bit of sport. I did soccer, taekwondo, but I joined the army cadets when I was 12 because I knew I wanted to join the army. And so I thought, you know, why not join the army cadets? And and back then in the, in the 90s, the army cadets was, you know, very different to what it is now. And I certainly speak about my experience in the book. It was a really good insight and preparation back then for me to sort of join the army and, and you know, working in the cadet corps and, you know, working with uh, regular army people, it just grew my interest even further. So what year do you front up and sign the dotted line? Yeah, so uh, 2000, 2000, I was 16 and I rocked up to defence recruiting and said, uh, here you going? My name's, my name's Scott and I want to be a paratrooper in three hour. Obviously it didn't quite work like that. I had to go through some other uh, hurdles. But yeah, 2000 and then uh, April 2001 was my first day in Kapuka. 
basic training. So you hit Kapuka. What's the timeline from getting to Kapuka and actually getting to try and go and be a paratrooper? Yeah, so I did basic training, which back then was six weeks. Um, after that, we did 10 weeks at the School of Infantry, where you do uh, infantry, you know, the School of Cool. And then after that, I was posted to three hour. I deployed to Timor in 02, so I didn't get to do my parachute course until I got back in 2003. But 2003 was a fully fledged paratrooper. Back in those days, getting to the battalion and not being parachute qualified and having not been to Innofet, your opinions were pretty much worthless <laughs> until you get your parachute course. Let's take a step back for a sec. What's your memory of September 11 then? Because you would have just, you're a fresh recruit, you're still, you know, getting into gear of it, and then this major world-changing event happens. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was the day before we were marching out of Singleton. Or I think we'd already marched out and we were getting driven down to three hour hour. And I got woken up in my room and one of the guys said, hey, look, mate, come to the rec room. Something's happened. I rushed into the rec room and watched the second planes hit. And I remember thinking to myself, God, how good is this timing? I was only 17, but I knew this was this event was significant because I didn't turn 18 until December. I remember thinking, oh God, what if we all go to war and I miss out? It just shows you how naive I was. Oh, will the war be over by Christmas? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Well, you get to participate first in World War Timor rather than anything specifically 9-11 related. Tell me about your experiences in Timor. It was the classic, you know, infantry. We do green hat clandestine patrols or blue hat patrols. We're in the UN hat and brazard. It was tough work. I was, you know, I was only 65, 66 kilos, just turned 18, and we're lugging these massive packs around. And it really was the cementing of the foundation infantry skills for me, despite the threat not really being what we probably all hoped it was. You know, you were out there as a section for, you know, 12, 13 day patrols up in the mountains in the jungle, cammed up, standing two in the morning, standing two at night. It was classic infantry stuff that probably hadn't changed a lot since Vietnam. So, Aside from uh, not firing a shot, it really sort of uh, instilled in me really early those fundamentals of soldiering, which, you know, I took those principles all the way through to my last day in service. You're doing the job for real, even though the stakes don't feel very high at the time you were doing it, you get to do the job for real. You're representing your country in a uniform overseas, and you are aware of what else is happening on the world stage right mm. now. You are getting a sort of practice run for the real trials ahead. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. And I think, you know, operations is one of those things that's the best way to learn. A month on operations could be equivalent to you know, three or four years of training because you actually get to utilize those skill sets real time. When you come back from Timor, are you chomping at the bit to get over to the Middle East? Do those opportunities feel thin on the ground or you're more focused on getting the paratrooper qualification first? Look, there, there wasn't really anything for infantry back then. I think uh, there was the SECDET trips to Iraq in Baghdad. They were very small and fleeting opportunities. Broadly speaking, there wasn't really many opportunities for infantry guys. You know, look, I was pretty happy. I've my goal in three hour uh, was to get to recon platoon because back then I thought that was the, you know, it is the epitome of, of soldiering in the battalion. So that was my immediate goal. And did you achieve that? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did the, um, I did the recon course 2004, 2005. Very challenging course. One, one two and three hour uh, where probably still are notorious for the difficulty of their recon courses. Once again, that was really good preparation for me for, for SF selection. Before we get to SF selection specifically, because there's obviously there's been decades of knowledge about the Special Air Service Regiment and that sort of would have had a strong place in the zeitgeist military culture at the time, whereas the Second Commander Regiment didn't exist then. It was for RAR bracket commando by the time this is occurring. Obviously, that's the East Coast capability, which is where you're based. Are you looking at the commanders going, that's my local opportunity? Are you looking at SASR because of the history there, have interest, or do you just want to get in anything that's SF? What's your mindset before approaching selection? I think all soldiers back in those days, you know, aspired to be in the SAS because there wasn't anything else, right? So there was one company of commandos at 4RR, which we didn't really see a lot of. But, you know, having read, you know, Bravo, it's easier, you know, the one that got away and, and sort of buying into that whole thing, you know, I think all recompletion soldiers wanted to go to the SAS. At the same time, I saw the growth of 4RR across the road, you know, and when I first got to 3RR, we used to ride dirt bikes on, on Luscombe Airfield, which is, you know, where the 6th Aviation Regiment is now. So there was nothing there. And then I'd see the growth, the SFTF started to get built. We'd do all these pack marches and see this enormous facility being built. And we saw guys in black and these four-wheel drives getting around and see guys with long hair and we'd see these tag guys flying around helicopters. And that sort of really sparked my interest. Being from Sydney, I'm a Sydney boy, I thought, well, I get to do the SF stuff and sort of stay in Sydney. So it was really being proximal to the growth of 4RAR that really fostered my interest and a lot of my cohort too from 3RAR that made the move across. Because we've got to remember the lack of information at the time because now there's lots of books, podcasts, social media, like there's a lot of information publicly accessible about both these capabilities if people want to look into that and aspire to that career, whereas back then there weren't many contemporary 
SAS books, there'd be nothing on commandos. And even you in the military had limited access to information. You'd have seen this and this kind of mysterious, intriguing, um, you know, visuals. And that's what's whetting your appetite. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. What's the process from seeing those guys in black with the long hair and sort of seeing what's going on over the fence, so to speak, and then going, okay, how do you then proceed to put your hand up and do selection? Yeah. So I'll put my application in for SF in 2004. I did the entry test in 2005. Then when I was panelled to go onto the selection course, we deployed to Timor. I had to wait until we got back from Timor. In actual fact, I had to reapply while I was in Timor. But Timor, for me, in 2006, I was uh, the 2IC and then a subsequent patrol commander of a recon team. We had a mixed one, two, and three-hour recon team. And for the first month, it was great. I had complete autonomy and we were doing you know, classic infantry you know, soldier work. But as the rest of the army started to filter in, then there was a distinct lack of trust for regular army to do anything. I think that culture persisted until very recently. Regular infantry were not entrusted to do anything and SF took on a lion's share of the work, uh, rightly or wrongly. So whenever something would happen in Dili, we'd you know, get on the radio and call it in and the response was always, yeah, wait. And we'd see guys from Perth or Sydney come in and sort of clean it up. So for me, that was, I saw SF as an organisation where people were entrusted to actually do the job. As has been well documented, that culture didn't really change for the entire Afghanistan campaign where no. you know, infantry guys, the, some of the best trained infantry soldiers in the world, were essentially doing sentry duty on engineers instead of out taking the fight to the enemy. I've often had it remarked to me, both like in conversation or privately, that there was a sort of sense that it was political decision in a way because it was much more palatable for gritty, slightly older special forces guy to be injured or worse killed in the line of combat. That's a more palatable headline for a politician than a young 20-year-old regular army soldier feel free to disagree with that interpretation, but that was one that a view that soldiers had given to me, that it was felt that our oh, SF are the ones we can afford to risk because that's going to be the more palatable thing to survive politically. I think that's 100% correct, mate. I think that's a correct observation and, and, and I agree with that. I think that political will to lose, you know, 18, 19 year old years was non-existent and it became more appealing for politicians, which is, I mean, war is just extension of politics, right? So to lose SF soldiers and in actual fact that, it probably held back the capability in so command because particularly for the east coast times in the early years we were doing jobs that was classic infantry work you could have deployed a company of regular instead of that platoon of sf and then the sf could have instead supplemented it exactly right exactly right so there were numerous times in the afghanistan campaign you know in my own experience where we could have leveraged the infantry assets you know within Ura's gun but it was zero appetite for it at the same time i think the best recruiting you can possibly do for sf was in afghanistan with the rar guys with the mtf and the rtfs where they could see what we were doing and they wanted a piece of it so it served that purpose at the same time coming back to timor although you can't forecast that this is what's going to happen for still many years to come at that point you still even see then that well they're getting obviously the best training, the better gear, and just the opportunity to do the job that you have the appetite to do. So you put your hand up, you go for it. When people talk about selection, whether often it's SAS, but also commandos have shared their stories of selection, it's one of the proudest achievements they have that they got through selection. It's the super grueling experience and just the relentlessness, the endurance test. What's your take on selection as former candidate 19? There's been a lot said about selection, but my personal view is that selection shouldn't be the focus. And I think people outside of SF talk a lot about selection as the main gateway. But the reality is, is selection is just the first step. Selection is just identifying people who have prepared, who can meet the physical requirements at a baseline and can be there at the end, right? So yes, selection is difficult. You get yelled at, you don't sleep, you don't eat. It's tough. It's hard. Got it. But the real test is a reinforcement cycle. I think that's something people don't talk about. You know, there's a whole industry based out there on copy and pasting training for selection and building resilience and so forth. I mean, anyone can do that for a few weeks, right? Anyone can put it on for a few weeks. The real test is 13, 14, 15 months of continual courses where you know, some of the courses in the reinforcement cycle are just as physically tough as selection, but you're expected to have outcomes, you're expected to learn, you're expected to absorb vast amounts of information. So so for me, yeah, selection was it was difficult, but for me, the real challenge was Rio because you, you can't fake it for 13 months when you're under constant assessment. And throughout that reinforcement cycle, people are still being removed. You know, we had a guy removed in you know, two weeks before we got our berets for failure, wow. failure to meet the standard. So I think part of the reason the reinforcement cycle isn't in the zeitgeist as much as selection is because people don't really know what happens. And that's probably a good thing, right? We don't want to be too transparent about, about how we train the ISF operators. But suffice to say, all the core skill sets, uh, you are required to continue to meet a standard. And you're constantly being assessed and it grinds on you. The reinforcement cycle is a real grind. There was a period there, and it has changed now, but there was a period where people could actually basically look up by 
reading certain books or whatever, the exact steps of what SAS selection was over in Perth. It was getting very transparent and commandos have shared their stories of it as well. And I know the format's changed now. Rio is the lesser spoken about thing for that reason, because it's just, and I'm glad it's not too transparent. So I'm not asking any secretive questions here. They're selecting you that you are trainable. They're selecting you to go, okay, they can take the punishment. The brain can still cope under the duress, but then also that they see something in you that you are actually going to be able to learn all these skills because it's a vast amount of technical skills, obviously like your basic weapon handling and all that kind of thing and your fitness, all that has to be standard. It needs to be, but there's a lot of other technical stuff, whether that's, I don't know, abseiling correctly out of a helicopter or there's all these kind of skills that I don't have the full list of obviously, cause I'm civilian, but there's just so much to learn. And then you've got to retain that, not just for an exam and then you move on, it's got active knowledge you've got to have deeply buried in the brain for use at a moment's notice. It might be years down the line you need that skill. There's so much to drill into you. Yeah, yeah there is, mate. I think it's the old jack of all trades, master of none. And I think that all SF operators would be, be lying if they thought that wasn't the case. Um, everyone has a, a baseline qualification and competency in a skill set, but there is that much involved that if you were to go out onto a task that involves a certain element of capability, you would need some time to unpack that and to fine tune it. There is a lot to it, but also I think that how people communicate that is also to the detriment of recruiting as well. For people who aren't in defence, people may think that the rest of the army is like so command. It is not. You know, you can be in the army and be terrible at your job and continually fail a course. You just keep doing it until you pass. Very few people fail courses in the army. You know, the army course structure and, and how the, the programs and are written are managed so that repeated attempts to pass, right? So very few people fail things in the army, whereas on the reinforcement cycle, that doesn't exist. You do get attempts at retraining and, and reassessment, but if you don't meet the standard, and, and it's not it's not that people aren't good enough or people are, are suboptimal, it's basically a time thing. When I was an instructor at the schoolhouse, if there was someone struggling with a skill set, we would do everything we possibly could as an instructor cohort to bring that person up to speed. But the reason we would fail him, outside of egregious safety instances or so forth, was basically lack of time to train them. Me focusing on one person was to the detriment of the rest of the course, then we would remove them for trainability. So. Like I've said before, if the reinforcement cycle went for five years or we had unlimited resources, then no one would ever fail a Rio because we've already invested so much money in that person through selection. But the reality is, is that we've got capability requirements to meet. We have to have output every year. And for that to occur, then people have to come off if they don't meet the, the crucial gateway. The guys that do selection with you and then later Rio, are they all coming from infantry corps? Is there a varied background trying to enter commandos? I think it's a very varied background. 10, 15 years ago, I probably still is predominantly infantry guys. You've got the DRS guys as well, and, and you've got guys from non-combat corps. And I think that's another misconception that, that infantry guys have a distinct advantage over non-infantry guys. In my opinion, that isn't correct. Yes, there are elements of the job that infantry guys would already master, particularly now infantry guys might already have good level of combat shooting and they know how to carry their gear and carry their pack if they've been out field they've got that, that lived experience of, of being out field but it's not an infantry job it is a special operations job so having people from diverse backgrounds value adds to the overall capability of the organization we've had guys where you might be an infantry six commander and guys are failing the commander temp tactics course which is our fundamental rural war fighting course and you've got a guy who was a mechanic in the air force and because he hasn't had any i don't want to say incorrect training but because the training isn't what we would direct he gets shown one way and he runs with it. Whereas infantry guys have to unlearn bad habits sometimes, or not, not bad habits, but different ways of doing things. So it sort of compounds that cognitive load on the individual, which sort of adds some more stress and possibly failure. But I think it's it's open to all people in defense. I think everyone should give it a crack. If you're not from infantry, you're certainly not at a disadvantage. Like you say there, one guy can, he's learned one way, then he can drop it and pick it and run with a new way. That's great. And that is a sort of ability that they're looking for because even if you learn things one way on Rio and if you're in commandos for 10 years, things aren't going to stay the same for 10 years. You exactly. have to you know, yep. adapt a tactic or a procedure or there's a new weapon or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got to have that ability to just adjust on the fly. And if they're too regimented, pun not intended, then it's not going to be a suitable match. Yeah, agreed. At this point, you are obviously displaying quite a level of competency because you are doing reinforcement cycle with the commandos. That's not a braggarty thing to say. It's just a, a fair observation. Do, is there a particular skill set or area that you're really feeling is your best? Like, are you best with your weapons handling or close quarter work? Or what's this, are there sort of areas you're really proud of with your skill set? Not really, mate, to be honest. I think I've always been in the middle. I've never been a star performer. I've never been given a student of merit. I've never um, excelled at anything. I think I've always been in the middle. I certainly wasn't the worst on the reinforcement cycle, but-, but Are you the grey man? 
Look, I think anyone that knows me would say I'm far from the grey man. I think my personality is not grey, but I think my <laughs> I think my my skills and competence will be classified in, in, the, in the spectrum of grey. I think I've always been there at the end. Never been a star performer, despite one of my best attempts. So I think it would be hubris if I told you that I excelled at one one course of Rio. Because I don't think anyone really excels in the Rio. So it's not designed that way. You can certainly do well. It's not designed to excel. Anyone that says that they excelled on a course in the Rio, I think I'd be happy to have a conversation about what metrics they're using. <laughs> Once you get through Rio, you get given the beret. Do you remember that moment well? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, it's certainly changed since I got mine in 2007. I think now we have a beret parade and guys get in their service dress and the families come and there's a proper event. Whereas back then it was, we stood in front of the battalion. It was 4 back then in the uh, OR's mess or the other ranks dining mess and lined up and got given our beret and we shook their hand and that was it. Within 12 months of that though, you would have been... Second Commando Regiment. Yeah, it wasn't long after, 2009, June 2009. Got my beret and then, you know, I'd spent six years in the Army already. I'd done two trips to Timor and hadn't really fired a shot. Didn't feel like I was validated or tested myself. And I think part of the reason I wanted to go SF is I wanted to see, am I actually capable of doing this? Is this something that I'm actually going to be good at? And, yeah, and all those questions were answered within three or four months of me getting my beret. I deployed to my first Afghanistan trip. What was your first impression of Afghanistan, that memory of seeing the vista as you land? Look, I was just so excited. I was just so, I'd read so much about Afghanistan and the history and graveyard of armies all the way from Alexander the Great through the two the Russians. And, and I think it was just, there's so much history there that there is so much to absorb. But I was just very, very excited. I was very, very naive, very, very green, 23, 24 years old. I just finished my Rio. So stoked to be there. Yeah. What were your first few weeks like? Were you doing some nursing patrols or getting straight out into the thick of it? What was happening? Uh, look, we did one one nursery patrol. I was the I was in the recon team, so I was an ATV. So most of my experiences in Afghanistan were on an ATV. The first operation that we did, we did a direct action raid, and I think it really sort of you know, drilled home to me why there is a selection course because you know, up until that point, once you're qualified, the actual job's great. You're not wearing a pack. You're not out bush for weeks and weeks. You know, work weekends, and, and this is great. On that first trip, I think we drove all night. Tried to rest up during the day, you can't because it's middle of summer. And we walked all the next night, hit a target, which was a dry hole, which is a term for nothing on target. And I was carrying a ladder, carrying all my gear, and you're still not climatized. It takes a few weeks to get your body ready for that sort of work, even just wearing body armor and walking. And on the way back, the Taliban initiated an, a remote controlled IED as we crossed the creek bed, and we lost two interpreters, got sort of blown to smithereens. And at that stage, I'd it was down to about a half litre of water and we sort of the sun was coming up already. So because we got hit, we had to sort of box around the long way back up to where our vehicles were. So I think overall we covered over 20 kilometres with not much water. And I think that was one of the hardest physical things that I've done. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, this is why there's a selection course. I remember thinking very clearly, fuck, if this is the second week, what's the next five months got in store for us? Yeah, and that selection course is done east coast of Australia versus the heat of Afghanistan at that time of year as well. And there is no safety net if things go wrong. So even in a, you, obviously two interpreters were killed, but it's still not, say, a heavy firefight. But the stakes are still very real because it's even just the elements to manage in that scenario. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The first time you get in a situation, in a contact where bullets are being exchanged, are you cognizant of the fact, okay, now I'm finally getting tested or is it just automatic response, do the things first? I'd like to say that I responded the way in which I thought I would, but I had so much pent up excitement. I was just so keen. I've spent, I don't know how many countless hours, weeks, months and years thinking about what it'd be like the first time I get in a gunfight. And when it actually happened, I think I was overexcited. I thought to myself, we got hit from the green belt, which is a sort of the agricultural hub we with our vehicles about 450, 500 metres away. We, we got shot up by the Taliban and I remember thinking, oh, okay, if this is the only contact I'm going to be in, I'm going to fire every weapon system I possibly can. So, you know, I fired an 84 rocket and a 6.6 rocket and I took one of the guy's guns off his car and I fired that and, you know, one of the guys was like, fuck, calm down, relax. That was my first sort of gunfight and every gunfight since you get into the rhythm, you know, I think it's, it's a learned experience. I think you're, it's one of those things you get better at. It sounds bizarre, but first time I got in a good gunfight was probably one of the best days of my life. Can you tell me about Mirabad Valley and your first deployment? Yeah, so we conducted this operation, uh, Operation Pila in the Mirabad Valley, which at that stage had no patrol bases as I did in, in subsequent years. And for Alpha Company in 2008, aside from our incursion into Helmand, I think that was, uh, that was a significant period of time. That was essentially the company being in contact for three days on and off. We had assaulters in the green belt being ambushed and having to withdraw under fire. We had multiple IEDs found. At one stage, almost every team in the company was in a gunfight in that valley and and that sort of persisted for over 48 hours and ended up in some more direct action raids. The term was disruption ops. 
it sounds vague, it probably was. The idea is to go and disrupt what they were doing. Essentially go out and get in gunfights. Aggressively disrupts what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. And it became a bit of a joke, you know, disruption operations. What is disruption operations? Well, it's whatever you call it, right? <laughs> a gunfight will generally be disruptive. Yeah, agreed. You described in that first contact your giddy you're firing every weapon you can get your hand on your real life call of duty soldier does that joy of getting to actually use the all the toys and test yourself does that ever leave you or does it never get old no i don't think it ever leaves you no you know, every single time i fight a weapon overseas it was almost surreal because you spend so much time it's and when people talk about reverting back to training it's like training yeah yes that is true but i think it's more just People talk about muscle memory, you know, muscles that have memories, their neural pathways. But I think you spend so much time shooting a weapon system in training that when you do it overseas, it becomes autonomous. And you have to sort of remind yourself that, okay, shit, this is real, you know, which is, I suppose, a testament to the training, right? We fire, you know, as you know, within within SF, we fire a lot of live rounds above and beyond what everyone else does in the Defence Force. So for some people, I think firing a live round, it can be a wow, but, but when you do it at Norsham, it becomes part of the course. Can't even imagine the ratio of... Uh, live rounds fired in practice or in you know, the like tag or whatever versus what you actually get to do out behind the wire, so to speak, is going to be a quite a discrepant ratio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then when you actually get to do it, that's the 1% of the actual lived experience yep. in the uniform is what you train for and what you live for. Exactly right, yeah. Talk to me about life back on base because there's a lot been talked about how SF had their own separate compound and maybe a bit more facilities and things like that. Did you get to make the most of all that? How much downtime do you have in these kind of... It's become a focal point post Brereton about, about the culture of SF. I look, I'm more than happy to give my own, own comments on it. For a long period of time, as we spoke to before, the government was happy outsourcing most of the heavy lifting to SF. With that came a level of not exclusiveness or elitism. The Privilege? I don't think privilege is the right word. Because people knew we were out fighting, guys are dying, we're doing things that no one else is. When we were back on base, they allowed us to relax. The whole issue of alcohol, this comment's probably going to be unpopular with a lot of officers, we had complete approval to drink. And in fact, alcohol was bought over for us from the command team for us to consume. Yeah, is it right or wrong that the regular army guys were beholden to a lot more rules than us? Yeah, probably, but we didn't really care. There was guys in the regular army that were being charged for having their sleeves rolled up and were sitting in tank tops drinking beers in the back deck listening to tunes. You could perceive that as a level of arrogance, but the reality was was that no one was going to say anything because we were the guys out doing the jobs that no one else was doing. Did sometimes people take it too far? Absolutely. You know, we had some of the wildest parties we've ever had in Afghanistan, but we never risked the jobs. No one would drink if there was a job coming up. Uh, you knew when you had downtime if there was a rotation. If you come off a long vehicle patrol, you knew how had a few days, we'd let our hair down. Look, I thoroughly enjoyed and some of my best memories of Afghanistan, you know, aren't from operations, they're from sitting around the lines, sitting in the back deck and for Perth Hills, the fat lady's arms. And we just did what diggers have done since the inception of our army, which was be larrikins and drink piss. If that is unpopular in today's view, then I'm sorry, but it was a different time and I certainly had no regrets. And I often laugh when I, when I see senior officers talk about standards and alcohol and so forth. And it's like, hang on, bro, I remember you were the OC and you were drinking piss with us in the back deck. <laughs> you know, so, you know, would it happen today? Absolutely not. But like I said, some of the most fondest memories I've had, it's important for the guys too. Some of the last memories the guys would have of people that have been killed would be sitting in the back deck, drinking beers, listening to tunes. So that's important. You can't expect a certain group of a population being, you know, Perth and Sydney to repeatedly deploy at the cost of their family, their time, not allow infantry to do that job and then turn around retrospectively and accuse them for not having the same behaviour standards as the guys who weren't really doing a lot. I think that is uh, that is very short-sighted. And um, I think there'll be ongoing conversations about whether or not it was a valid method to vent stress or manage the extremities of the job, things like that. Other people will continue having those chats. But I think something that's really hard to deny is that the camaraderie and the mateship at Fosters, and those are the buzzwords we love talking about, are Australian mm -hmm. military, because there's a long history of that. Having seen pictures of events in Fat Lady's Arms, you've got to say it's true. Look, and, and it's the thing, mate, you know, I think people talk about decompression and, and the reality is, right, yoga and meditation and talking about your feelings and, and all that shit, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. The best way to deal with things that are happening, and not in a negative way, you know, the best way to, to manage those things and to build rapport is, is alcohol. Dark anyway. humour, all that's kind of outlets. Yeah, I'm absolutely right. No one will ever drink alcohol because people don't want to risk their careers being in charge of an alcohol incident. And there certainly have been that. But once again, military is just a, you know, a cross-section of society, right? And if you get a bunch of similar age people that are in Sydney or Perth and you look at what happens in society, you know, I don't make a strong argument that you're going to have a lot more issues than a few alcohol incidences. I think alcohol really is the, the lubricant for team cohesion. I think it is the, the lubricant for building relationships. 
and I'd be very happy to have a conversation with someone that had any ideas to the contrary because they're just fucking un-Australian. <laughs> Besides the bar, you had other sort of outlets for that kind of stuff too, like the gym or I've been told many a times of people just going back from a patrol and then they go and play Call of Duty <laughs> because yeah. they couldn't get enough of it out in the field. And ultimately you're just there 24-7 hand in glove with mm. your mates and people you have been fighting mm. directly with in the battlefield. And I think that the closeness of those bonds and the extremity of that environment, it's really hard to imagine and replicate anywhere else in society. Oh, look, absolutely right. And I think it's also important to note that people only ever see the highlight reels of the SOTG. The reality is there was a vast majority of the time you're doing fuck all, that team cohesion and getting to know you guys. Yes, it happens in combat, but combat is a very, very small percentage of the time of your deployment. A lot of the time you're spent just sitting around the desert, whinging about the heat, wish you had cold water, wishing you were back in the lines, you know, in air conditioning. But I think those those moments are important too because that's sort of you know shared misery that builds that team bonding environment. Before we get to the infamous battle of Shawali Kot, are there any other sort of memorable engagements or contacts or patrols that stand out in your mind that you want to talk about? There are a few, but we probably don't have the time to get into it now. I'd probably say buy the book and uh, you can get over <laughs> I think safe to say there's a variety of stuff from those like direct action disruption operations and like you're moving around buildings, there'll be stuff that's longer range. The book's going to offer that whole range of all those kind of moments that readers are going to want to get their hands on and experience. Look, exactly right. And I think I was very cognizant, you know, when I wrote this book where I, I didn't just want to give a superficial account where, you know, I'm the own hero of my story and everyone's their own hero of their story, right? So I wanted to ensure that the reader got above and beyond a superficial explanation this group moved here and did that okay well what were you thinking how did you feel you know what did you say i really try and put the reader in that moment for them to get a better understanding of what it's like and it's a realistic account people often talk about combat and killing and it's like oh well you know i didn't want to do it but it's it's for the job and but the reality is is that i don't know a single operator that was ever sad they're in a gunfight i don't know a single operator that's got PTSD from killing the enemy it just doesn't happen I think that's important for people to recognize. And it may come across as psychotic, but you need to keep in mind that we spend our entire lives training for this moment. So getting to do it real time is just a validation in our view. And we don't really think about the overall picture about why we're here and what are we doing. You know, it's only been very recently that I've looked back and actually read books and sort of studied this and thought to myself, what exactly was the strategy overall? And still now, if I was still in the army, I wouldn't care where you go. You send me to any country and get in a gunfight, I'll do it. We don't buy into the politics and why we're there. That isn't our job describing it as, oh, this company moved here and did that. That's an historian's book or a general's book. And those are important, have their own place as well on the shelf. But then what you're describing is the soldiers, is that mindset, is that understanding of what's going through your head in those experiences. Yeah, exactly right, mate. And I think there's a lot of things that people don't know about, for example, in the officers versus you know, other ranks within the command. You know, officers only spend a very small period of time. Once an officer does selection, they might get two years in charge of a, of a troop or a platoon before they move on to maybe a squadron company time. But after that, they're in management roles. And this certainly isn't to minimise what other guys have done. There is certainly some really good material out there that hopefully can enhance and enrich people's lives and perspectives. But I'm not selling anything here. I'm not selling you know, I'm not selling leadership. I'm not selling resilience. This is not going to make you a better leader. It's not going to make you more resilient because who the fuck am I to try and – I'm certainly not the bastion of leadership and resilience. But all I'm doing is just – uh, telling the story of a guy who served for 22 years and just loved his job and I want to give people that insight. A fair way to think of it is because as you said you don't know an operator that would have PTSD from being in a gunfight and if you magically plucked an Australian civilian and put them right in the middle of a gunfight and gave them a weapon in Afghanistan and they had to shoot someone yeah they would have PTSD from that and that's totally fair enough because they're not trained for that they don't have the mindset for that they don't have the background for that and they didn't ask for it whereas uh, it is giving an insight into the journey from being interested and joining up and to all the training, all the preparation, all the experiences leading up to those moments, it's to connect because there is sometimes a disconnect, I think, between the media and the reality of the war or the reality of war and even the public because there's got to be a, a better bridge of understanding of why our diggers want to do this job and then why things happened when we were over there in certain ways. Better understanding your mindset, your zeitgeist, uh, you and your comrades. I think only enhances the conversation around the usage of our military past and in the future. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, I agree with that. So how many uh, deployments to Afghanistan do you have overall? did uh, three SOTG deployments, a bunch of PSD roles in and out of the Middle East. So a lot of personal security detail work. One of the contacts that you're in that is very well known is the Battle of Shawali Kot. Can you tell me a bit about your experiences with that? Obviously, there's going to be all the detail in the book, but it's sort of a 
top picture summary? Yeah, sure, mate. So I actually missed out on most of Shawalikot. There was a range incident that I was involved in, as well as another incident where I was not allowed to go outside the wire for a period of time. That eventuated in a court martial when I came back to Australia. I wanted to ensure that I captured the stories of the guys who were at the coalface during the battle, because I think the Battle of Tezak is very well known. Wilt BRS was awarded his VC, but what isn't that well known is the story of Force Solomon Bravo being, you know, two commando in Shinatu. At the same time, I think an unfair weight has been placed on Shwali Cot because of the fact that there was two, both SAS and two commando gunfight in close proximity, the one led to Victoria Cross, but... It's unusual. Look, it, it is unusual, and I think that if that wasn't the case, this may not have been a, a battle honour because from my experience and speaking to guys and what two commando have done in Helmand in terms of intensity, in terms of gunfights, in terms of enemy killed in action, in terms of families killed in action, I think it would be a very myopic view to think that you know, Shwali Cot was the biggest battle that Australians were ever in, which is not the case. Now, there were gunfights and operations that two commando did that don't even have names that uh, I would make a strong argument for that would sort of supersede. It depends on what metric you use, right? But look, overall, politically, yeah, it was at Bella Shwali Cot, and, and it certainly was intense. And I've gone to great lengths to interview the guys who were there, and I think the guys from the sniper team through to guys in, in, in Oscar platoon, through a November platoon, through to mortars, just the, the enemy picture and the organisation Battle smarts. Yeah, so I think it's unprecedented in the fact that, you know, the Taliban were well organized and they're using flags to communicate above and beyond their traditional means of communication. Our intelligence elements could, you know, pick up on some of the gunfights and some of the ambushes. And there's a story of, uh, of Marley Gray, one of the assaulters in Oscar platoon, and he's completely pinned down, getting shot from two different directions. He took his pack off and started digging a hole thinking to himself what's going to happen. This is where he's making his last stand. Those sort of stories, they need to come out. And it's not culturally consistent for guys to come out and say, look at what I did. But my intent was to not make this all about me. I want to bring the unit on the journey. Yeah, so Shawali Kai, I think it's a really important part part of the book, even though I wasn't there for most of it, for Australians to get an understanding of exactly what happened. But I like that you've included it in the book, not just from your limited perspective or providing a couple of brief contextual paragraphs that you are actually going, okay, I'm going to interview the guys who were there because it's a memoir, but you are imbuing unit history, unit representation is an important part of that. And the fact you've gone and spoken with a bunch of old comrades of yours who were there, that, I think that's a wonderful contribution. Yeah, thanks, mate. Look, I think it's important. And, you know, the initial manuscript was 100 and, 190,000 words, I think. Whoa. And the publishers cut it down to 120. And God, I'm not an author. I didn't fucking know this, right? Alan and I were basically saying, look, is this a history book or is it a memoir? Because you can't have both. And I thought, well, why not? But then uh, you know, through the editorial process, I soon realized that they were right. So there was a lot of stories that didn't make it to the book. The things that I was on the periphery of or things that I was involved in to some degree are all in the book. It's memoir and you fleshed it out where you needed yeah, extra help. Yeah, right? exactly right. And I've got dozens of hours of, of Zoom interviews with all the guys and there's a lot of good stuff that didn't make this book, which is a shame. Soon after that battle is also a very well-known helicopter crash. Talk to me about that. We were flying in a three-ship package into northern Kandahar. I was in the lead aircraft. It was my sniper team and Pete Rudland's team. It was an assault team that was supporting us. Yeah, we crashed at a high speed of knots. We were all severely injured. Ben Chuck, Tim Applin and Scott Palmer were killed, along with Brandon Silk, the uh, 101st Airborne Loadmaster. That was not a pleasant day. But once again, I think there's been a lot of focus put on you know us guys who survived it. We didn't really do a lot. You know, I sat in a helicopter that spun around. I ended up with a bunch of broken bones. But I think what I'd really like to put the focus on is is the guys who were in the second and third helicopter that landed. And what those guys did and what those guys saw is firstly is the only reason that guys like myself and Pete Budland and Gary Wilson are alive today. The effects that it's had on those guys, some of those guys have you know, since committed suicide. Some of those guys have severe PTSD. You wouldn't know it on the day. From my memory and from speaking to the guys, and once again, I said before, I'm not trying to sell resilience, but what I'd like to let the readers know and, and give an insight into these remarkable men who, you know, sitting in a helicopter, we were home in a week, and all of a sudden, aircraft bursts into a ball of fire, and they land, and they just see you know, this wreckage over 100 metres, dead and broken bodies everywhere, bullets cooking off, the aircraft's on fire, it's three in the morning, we're still in enemy territory. And not one of those guys dropped their bundle. Not one of those guys gave in to the situation. They all reverted back to their training. There were guys who stopped working their best mates because they knew there was nothing could be done. And they worked on guys they weren't even friends with. We had one, what's called a kilo, which is a civilian paramedic equivalent. He's still serving in the unit, in the army rather. He wasn't really treating people. It was the, the combat first aiders. It was the guys in the teams that were treating their mates. And, and I think it's a testament to those men that you know, we're all here today. I really want to put the focus back on those guys because 
their journey and their contribution has been lost over the years. So you survive this helicopter crash and you're unusual in that you go back to active service. After this, you come home, there's the court martial you mentioned, but you're still back in Afghanistan again before our presence there in the war ends. How was your final deployment in 2013 compared to your first one? Yeah, I suppose I'd like to point out too that it wasn't just me. There was one other member of the chopper crash who continued to serve and is still serving. He was not reinstated in full capacity, but he's certainly deployed on, on a long-term PSD and he's still serving. So I think you know people say that I'm the only one that's returned to full operational service. Well, I was the only one that made it back in a full operational capacity in terms of my role as a commando, but this other member certainly has contributed just as much. I and mean, he's still serving to this day. So I was a few years older. I think for me... Coming back into Camp Russell for that last rotation was really special for me because I didn't think I'd make it. So the whole the whole story of my recovery and my addiction to pain medication and the court martial and so forth and my own personal journey and demons, I think, came to an end when I walked back through those gates. So for me, it was really, really important to be there. A few weeks prior to us being there, you know, Cameron Baird, VCMG, had been killed. So the war was wrapping up. Obama announced that we've won the war, we're going home. And then the focus became towards the middle of the trip, what's called retrograde or basically packing up shit and going home. In terms of kinetic, it wasn't as kinetic as, you know, other SOTGs because the focus was shifting more on us getting out of there. Did you look at the country at the time and could you see differences in how the country was running, et cetera? Was there some kind of metric you could feel we've made a difference to this point since you were starting to pull out, that was on the horizon? Did you feel like work was being undone? Because there's the obvious hindsight of what happened in 2021, but at the time, did it feel like, progress has been made, a contribution has been made. What was your headspace on that? Depends on what metric you use, right? Talking about politics, the economy, trade, just for my observations rolling around Tarrant Cout, I think their lives had improved. There was more infrastructure, there were schools, hospitals. There was the beginnings of a, of a real functioning country that wasn't run by warlords. That's just a very thin veil, I think. In the background, there was still egregious corruption, you know, tribal conflict. When they said that the war's won, we're going home, I remember thinking to myself, we're out in Langar, and I'm like, where? I think it's a very short-sighted view that what happens in the tribal regions of southern Afghanistan is a long way from the halls and power of Kabul. I intend to think that these people living the way that they have, which hasn't changed in, since centuries, that they have some sort of buy-in and a cognizant of what's happening in Kabul is just completely incorrect. They have a very macro or micro view rather on what's happening, which is their village, the next village over. So I think very early I recognised that this was a tribal conflict that was a lot more complex than simply bringing in a democratic government and making everyone elect. How are you to these people? <laughs> you know, when you on the earlier Afghanistan rotations, guys came across this old guy and he asked them if they were Russians. Just to give an indication as to... Wow. I've certainly, just because I was in the country and I'm an SF guy, I certainly don't pretend to have any view of macroeconomics in the area or any type of geopolitics. I certainly, it is in my bag. I'd be talking out of turn if I did. But I did notice a difference, yes. You come home from that deployment. Did you expect you were going to guess another combat warlike deployment again? Did you think that was going to be it for your service? I certainly wasn't ready to get out. I don't think we knew what was coming around the corner with Iraq. The war finishing was good in a lot of ways, particularly for two commando, because Afghanistan had been our focus for so long. A lot of what we did was tailored towards Afghanistan, aside from the domestic counterterrorism role. And I think that when the war finished, we sort of thought, well, okay, great. Afghanistan's finished now. We'll, maybe we'll get a break and take our foot off the pedal and explore some other things. But now, the first year after Afghanistan was one of the busiest years we ever had because during the Afghanistan years, there was no talisman saber, there was no hamel, there was no, there was none of that shit. You know, we just did our thing. You know, guys would come away and do promotion courses and so forth. You know, all of a sudden after Afghanistan, then we're starting to do all these major exercises, which which is great for the regular army that that's their one focus for the year. But we'd have guys away in Southeast Asia for three months and come home and they'd spend three weeks with talisman saber and they'd come home and go somewhere else. So I think the tempo increased drastically after Afghanistan. So you come back, you've got all these exercises, you're working tag. When do you hear that you're going to Iraq? So we were actually in, over in Holland for Operation Haywick. So part of the SF task group that was sent over after MH17 was, was shot out of the sky. So we were based in Eindhoven, us and Perth in a combined task group. While we were doing that, the other platoon in Charlie Company was in PNG in the jungle. They were pretty pissed off about because we were enjoying the recreation elements of Amsterdam with the other boys up to their knees in the jungle. On the way home, Iraq kicked off. Those guys from PNG got sent back to Sydney and they got redeployed to the UAE, which obviously, you know, as you know, is where Camp Baird, our logistical hub. When we came back from Holland, we spent four days in the States, came back to Sydney, and then the CEO met us at Tobruk Lines at Holsworthy, and he said, you know, most of you guys are going to be deploying in the next few days. So Charlie Company turned around and went back to UAE, which formed Special Operations Task Group 1 in Iraq in 2014. 
Talk me through your experiences in Iraq. As a sniper supervisor, I was in uh, Baghdad training the special tactics unit. So initially I was to train the snipers, then my role changed over to training the first special tactics unit in hostage rescue, because I was a sniper supervisor and a CQB supervisor. So I got sort of moved to both. Our rotation had a big contribution towards the Battle of Mosul. So we had a lot of guys that contributed significantly towards that. My job was just staying in Baghdad. So I missed out on all the fun stuff. I made the best of it. I had complete autonomy. I had a 2IC. I was a corporal at the time. Uh, he was a Lance Corporal. I had a few Americans and some Italians and a bunch of interpreters and I had complete autonomy to train five companies of Iraqis for five months. I really, really enjoyed that. I think it's because my expectations were managed. I knew I wasn't going to be out shooting people. I knew I wasn't going to be out doing kinetic operations and I just enjoyed the time for what it was. I enjoyed the facilities and the mess. I knew when it was wing night, when it was taco night, when it was Indian night. And then I spent seven months training the Iraqis. I really enjoyed that deployment, to be honest, even though it wasn't war fighting in the classical sense. I was really proud of the contribution that we were making in support of, of our Iraqi partners in the fight against ISIS. How did you find working with the Iraqi military? Because they have been raised after sort of the country was being rebuilt after the earlier war, and then you're used to working with the best of the best in the Australian Defence Force, and then you're training these guys is it back to basics is it a bit more advanced than that what was the skill level like that's a good question and these are questions that i sort of asked myself so one of the first things that i did when i got over there was to instead of just copy and pasting what the other rotations had done i wanted to really get a, an understanding of who these guys were right for me to formulate a training program in a short amount of time with you know finite resources i had to really manage find out who these guys were so i sort of sit there and you know, informally speak to these guys i'd have one-on-one -on -one interviews with with all the team leaders and the officers and you know what i soon found out was that these guys yes they're not going to be us right they don't have the same standard of training and equipment as us when it comes to war fighting some of these guys for some of the most experienced war fighters in the world i had a team commander been fighting in Iraq for over 15 years. He was in every battle in Fallujah and Ramadi. And they showed me videos. One of the team leaders showed me a video of them fighting in a hospital in Fallujah. And some of that footage, the most intense close quarter battle that I've seen. You know, these are guys firing machine guns inside hallways, inside a hospital fighting upstairs. So I soon realized that I'd have to exercise caution and not be dismissive of these guys' experience and also use that experience and tailor it to what I wanted them to achieve. I a lot of respect for those guys. When a lot of their countrymen are fleeing as refugees, you know, these guys are staying back and they're fighting for their country. Very, very high opinions of these guys. Now, once again, they're not going to be us. You know, if you use the metric of training and equipment, they're not us. If you just look at who they are, the country they're in, I think they're remarkable. So you come home, I assume, in 2018 from the end of that 2017 deployment to Iraq. Talk me through the journey over the next few years from there to when you eventually discharge. Are you doing a lot of tag time, training? What's happening in your career? Yeah, look, we did a bunch of exercises. I rotated on TAG uh, as an assault team leader, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I knew my the injuries that I sustained in the helicopter crash that I knew my body was was starting to come undone and I knew my time was marked. So I you know, started to think about a transition plan. And as I was spoken about before, I think transition is one of those things that, that I've seen done very poorly in the past and I wanted to give myself the best chance possible. So I asked to get posted to the Defence Force School of Special Operations when I got promoted to sergeant because I thought that your career starts in the schoolhouse and I thought it'd be a good way to get back and finish in the schoolhouse and more importantly, give my body a break. I think I underestimated how much work that involved because my body certainly didn't get a break. Yes, I'm not on the tools running around, but when you're standing on a range in body armour and helmet for 12 hours a day for weeks and weeks on end, it's just as bad on your back. Look, I wanted to give back and more importantly, I knew that the management experience that I would get as a senior instructor at the school would be invaluable for me in my post-service career. I think being a team commander on TAG is great, ticking that box in your soldier career, but it really has no meaning outside outside of defence. So for me, I recognise that you know managing courses of 120 people for six weeks and managing a, you know, a vast amount of resources and time and so forth will give me the experience that I could leverage in post-service and I certainly have done that. I really enjoyed my time. I think the Defence Force School of Special Operations is predominantly, it's obviously all changing over the Joint Selection Course, but you have a small cadre of instructors inside Training Wing that are all commandos that deliver all the content in the reinforcement cycle. Those guys work really, really hard each year. You know, we send guys there and they work their ass off to produce the next bunch of operators. When it came time for it to be your last day, did it feel like it was the right time? Look, I don't ever think there is a right time. I am. I wanted to leave the army on my choosing. I wanted to leave it what what I thought and perceived as a height of my career. I was a fourth year sergeant. I'd done all my supervisor courses. I had the experience in different operational spectrums and capabilities from warfighting through the PSDs, through to counterterrorism and so forth and sniping. 
So for me, I, I really sat there and said, well, am I just hanging around because I'm scared of change or am I hanging around because I think I've got more to give? There's more I want to do. And what I realized, mate, was that there actually wasn't a lot more I wanted to do. And what I didn't want to do is you know, hang around for the sake of hanging around because it was easy, because I was scared of change. And to be that guy who tells everyone that he used to be an operator 15 years ago, but he can't now because he's got a broken back and he's in the seven shop. We certainly do need guys to hang around with that experience, don't get me wrong. But that just wasn't me. I'll leave at 40 years old, so it was just over 22 years. I thought it was the right time to leave and it was bittersweet. I approached my last day with a lot of trepidation, as I'm sure everyone does. Everyone has their journey and, and some guys like to just take their foot off the pedal and relax. That certainly isn't me. So I've kept myself busy the entire time, but it's, it's always a difficult thing to do. And of course, there's days where I turn around and, and look back and say, I haven't made the right choice, but I know it was the right thing to do for me. You have kept yourself busy since then. You've got a master's of business and you're doing a lot of important charity work in the veteran space as well. Yeah, that, that's right, mate. I'm a big supporter of the boys and girls in the 079 Foundation. They're the only registered charity in the country that just service commandos and their families. There's a lot of charities out there that do fuck all. You know, there's a saying in business, business becomes too big to fail well, in the veteran space. Some businesses have become too big to matter. And I think, you know, the boys and girls at the 079 Foundation do uh, remarkable work. I think they they are taking four families of the fallen over to Hawaii this year to be recognised as the first, uh, second Australian Gold Star families. And they continue to work behind the shadows to really value add in a meaningful way. So I help those guys out whenever I can. Do you have a plan for what's next or you're just focused on getting the book out there one day at a time? I'll go to a consulting company and I've got a few contracts with different businesses doing a bunch of different things from business development through to, through to train delivery. So I definitely don't want to work full-time five days a week because I'm really enjoying having some agency over my time. My daughter's a big dancer. She's nine and she does, you know, 16 hours of dancing a week. So it's only been very recently where my wife will say, hey, um, your daughter's got a dancer set food on this date. Can you make it? And I can say, well, fuck, you know what? I actually can because in the past it's always like, I don't know. I don't know. It's good knowing what I'm going to be doing and having some time to just focus on, on being a family. What happens long-term, I have no idea, to be honest. I think that's wonderful that you can prioritise now what you really want to prioritise, which is family. Look, it is, mate. And, and there's also, I've really gotten back into skydiving as well. I hadn't jumped in years because I've got my spine fused and the army, you know, rightly so, probably said that I shouldn't jump out of planes because I've got 10 screws and two plates in my back. I listened to them when I was in, but now that I'm out and I've got a gold card, it doesn't matter if I break because it's covered for life. So. <laughs> uh, you're not the only 079 member I know who uh, loves a skydive. Um, <laughs> let's quickly come back to the book, Forged in Fire. You talked about it was kind of a cathartic, self-processing thing, and then it found its way into a book. How did you find once you sort of realized, I'm going to give this structure, I'm going to make this an actual publication that will be in bookstores for people to read, was that confronting at all? Was that fun? How'd you find that? I'm still going through it. I still got to pinch myself. When I came in and gave you a, a signed book this morning, getting in my hand, it's like, shit, I'll write this book. It's a really weird experience for me. The process of putting the book together was was really easy. I think I was very lucky that the Alan and Unwin, the publishers, really backed me on this book. They really believe in this book and they believe in my story and they've certainly been there to mentor me and guide me through the process. So yes, I'd already written the book when I approached them, but it certainly wasn't ready to publish. I'm not a writer. Yes, they're all my words, but in terms of structure and where to move things around, their input was invaluable. Scott, you've certainly done quite an aggressive pre-order marketing campaign, as we <laughs> talked about before we sat down in front of the microphones. You've built quite a social media following as well. Where can people follow you to follow future adventures? Yeah, thanks, mate. On my Instagram, Instagram, I post a bunch of you know, content and photos that isn't in the book. I also put up my, my events, events for the book tour, podcast, radio shows, etc. So my Instagram is scott underscore writer underscore Z-E-R-O-7-9. I'm sure I'll put a link up anyway when you post this. But people reach out for a whole bunch of reasons. People reach out to find out more about joining the command or joining as a commander, which I'm certainly there to help. There's also opportunities for signed books and book signings and so forth. Obviously, I'm, you know, I don't want to be a public figure. I have no interest in, in being famous. I'm happy to remain in the shadows and promote the book. People can certainly use their Instagram to come meet me here. Well, if you're listening to this podcast, the book is out now, paperback, ebook, audiobook. Audiobook, yep. All formats. So go get a copy, absorb the full story, follow Scott online, all the things. Scott, thank you so much for your service. 22 years is a huge amount of dedication. You're still giving back in this space through the charity work and you're shining a light on the Second Commando Regiment, which I appreciate is something that really needs to be done. So it's, yes, it's your memoir, but it's also doing more than that. It's many people's story through one story. So thanks for all the contributions and for speaking with me today. Amazing, Alex. Thanks so much for having me, mate. Appreciate it. 
I'm Alex Lloyd, and you've been listening to Life on the Line. For more insight into the Battle of Shawali Kot, listen to the Season 4 episode, number 92, Dean Parkinson, Volume 2. We got hit from four sides all at once, deafening. And for more about the June 2010 helicopter crash, listen to Thomas Kay's interviews with Gary and Renee Wilson in number 100, Gary Wilson. In the three months, I'd lost half my body weight. I was below 50 kilos and this nurse put me back in bed. She goes, Mr. Wilson, you're in a helicopter crash. The partners, Renee Wilson. Then the Padre got out of the car and he introduced himself as the Padre. And I looked at him and I remember thinking, well, I'm fucked. That's it. They don't bring a Padre to tell you that someone's hurt themselves. This is serious. And available on YouTube, Life After Service, Gary and Renee Wilson. That's sort of what's kept us going together. I just know you're both on the same side. Yeah. You know, you're not fighting, you're fighting with each other, not against each other. Mm. You can also listen to number 152, Peter Rudland. The Taliban had come up and said that they were going to attack us at 10 o'clock. Our guys had got on that and had been distributed across the call sign. So we were expecting to be hit at 10 o'clock. We were watching their families and all that sort of stuff leaving the village. So we knew it was going to be a big one, going to be game on. As the 10 o'clock came, their families are still walking down this creek bed. They started shooting and the shooting went straight over the top and then towards their families. Scott Ryder's memoir, Forged in Fire, is available now in print, ebook, and audiobook, where all good books are sold. Follow us at Life on the Line Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, at LOTL Pod on Twitter, and at Thistle Productions on LinkedIn. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thank you for listening, and lest we forget.